shoulders, but there may well be teenagers in here tonight. And I know it's a difficult thing being a teenager. And if you're a teenager in here tonight, you probably don't realise how much of a cock you are most of the time. This is a niche but overdue video about um, the Scouse dialect, which is spoken in the Liverpool, Merseyside areas in what some people would call northwestern England, what some people would call the northwest Midlands. Um, and Scouse is a very unusual dialect within its situation. So you have the, the, the traditional Cheshire dialect continuum, the traditional Lancashire dialect continuum, then you have Scouse in the middle, which is, it has resemblances to the southern Lancashire dialect continuum, but it's very unusual within that area. So this video is kind of going to be a dissection of what exactly makes Scouse different and then maybe a little uh, musing into why it might be different uh, in the ways that it is. First of all, we'll go through some aspects of Scouse pronunciation that are connected to more traditional Lancashire features. I'll use some linguistics terminology, but I'll try and define things on the screen so that people uh, can sort of read along. Um, you have a usual characteristically Northern English thing, which is that the vowels in foot and strut haven't split away from each other. So words like cut, soot, put and gutter all have the same stressed vowel. Uh, and the quality is probably something like o, oh, although that will depend on the speaker. A more regional Northwestern feature is the square nurse merger, which makes the vowels in the words square and nurse identical. And this can be found in a lot of places in Lancashire, uh, and the merge quality tends to be closer, generally, to what the nurse vowel is in dialects without the merger, so square, nurse. Um, in Scouse, the end quality can also be closer to what would normally be the square vowel, so nurse, square. And this merger generally causes the words fair and fur to be pronounced identically, either as fur, fur, or as fair, fair, or something in between. See the lover that's sleeping, we must show. And finally, in common with a lot of northern dialects, for most speakers, the ng sound, ng, ng, is always followed by a g. So sing, thing, instead of sing, thing. Ng, ng, sing, thing. I don't know, it's a difficult thing, difficult thing. Um, this was how things worked in Old and Middle English. Ng was just an allophonic pronunciation of n when it appeared before a g. So that, I, I think that's probably a continuation and that, that happens in Manchester and other parts of the northwest as well. Some aspects of the Scouse vowel system differ a lot depending on the speaker and exactly where they come from and also sometimes on what age they are. So for example, the vowel in the word start generally has the tongue low, as it does in most English dialects, but it could be pronounced with the tongue low and quite forward in the mouth, start, or with the tongue low and quite backwards in the mouth, start, and again that will depend on the speaker. So what about this vowel system is different from what you might expect of a Lancashire dialect, bearing in mind Liverpool was in Lancashire until not that long ago. A few key differences come out when you look at the diphthongs, the vowels that glide from one quality to another. For one thing, the face and goat vowels are diphthongs in Scouse, whereas in, in the rest of Lancashire they'd be mono, monothongs in most cases, something along the lines of face, goat. You can hear the tongue and lips stay pretty much in the same place the whole time you're pronouncing the vowel. E, O, face, go. In Scouse, they tend to be narrow, raising diphthongs, so the tongue gets slightly higher in the mouth while you're saying the vowel. Face, goat. The goat vowel has a lot of variation around Liverpool, so it might be more backed, goat, or it might start more centrally in the mouth, goat. The goose diphthong is also different. Throughout a lot of Lancashire, older speakers are more likely to say something like goose, goose. But in Scouse, it's more likely to be goose, goose. And finally, Scouse has the two weak vowels, uh and i, merged in unstressed positions so that chicken and sicken rhyme, something like chicken, sicken. The consonants stand out in a number of ways as well. So Scouse is completely non-rhotic, which means the r sound is only pronounced normally if a vowel comes straight afterwards. So it's pronounced in red, grit, orange, but not in car, butter, nurse. And this is true of the majority of dialects across England these days, but strangely enough, Lancashire is one of the few places that roticity has held on. You could reasonably expect Scouse English to be rhotic and to pronounce the r in all these positions, but it doesn't. Um, and traditionally that r sound is an alveolar tap, ra, ra, or very occasionally I think a trill, ra, ra. Plosive consonants in Scouse are very often affricated, so a normal plosive consonant is like p, t, g, d. You obstruct some part of your vocal tract 
air builds up behind the obstruction and then you release that air in a burst. Puh, puh, tuh, tuh. But when plosives get affricated, you partly release that obstruction, but you keep the vocal tract closed enough that there's some friction as the air comes out. So some examples of affricates are ch, ts, k. It's a plosive released into a fricative. T, sh, t, sh, ch, ch. The most commonly affricated plosives in scouts, as far as I know, are t, d, k. I've previously transcribed Scouse T as a T that releases into a S, an alveolar sibilant, T, T. But transcriptions I've seen by people who know a lot more about Scouse than I ever will tend to have it released into a voiceless alveolar fricative, which actually sounds right now that I listen back to it. In here tonight, in here tonight, in here tonight. And K tends to get released into a velar fricative, K, K. Although I'm sure I've heard some speakers release it into some kind of uvular sound as well, K, K. To look in the mirror. To look in the mirror, to look in the mirror. At the ends of words in certain situations, t can be lenited to the point that it's pronounced as h. So the words it and what might be pronounced i, wa. Listen to how John Bishop says it in this recording. He said, then we come and get it. He said, then we come and get it. He said, then we come and get it. And finally, non speakers of Scouse might hear th and the as if they were pronounced t and d. Thanks, doll, da. It might sound like th has merged with t and the has merged with d. But in reality, for a lot of speakers, that distinction is still maintained. It's just not maintained in a way that's easy to hear if you don't speak the dialect. Th and the become dental plosives with the tip of the tongue against the backs of the front teeth. T, d, t, d. Whereas t and d stay alveolar sounds as they are in most dialects. Uh, and as I've just said, they are often affricated. What are you doing with them on events? What are you doing with them on events? What are you doing with them on events? So why does Scouse have all of these regionally unusual features? Well, like a lot of urban dialects, a huge amount of this change is probably a result of immigration uh, of people from different sort of dialect areas, especially Irish people in this case. There's a 2007 paper which I'll link in the description. It references an earlier bit of research that combs through all of the literature trying to find references to a specific distinctive Liverpool dialect. And the idea of that was that at some point in the past, Liverpudlians must have spoken a dialect that was more in line with other Lancashire dialects. Um, of course, it would always have had its own regional features, but they wouldn't have been as unusual as they are now, um, until a period of outside influence produced a really distinctive Liverpool dialect that was the ancestor of the Scouse we hear today. The researcher mentions a text from 1830 where two Liverpudlian characters speak with a lot of common Lancashire features that aren't common anymore in modern Scouse. And that suggests that 1830 might have been some kind of pre-Scouse point in time. And then by 1889, people are making references to a Liverpool and Birkenhead dialect, which is noticeably different to those around it. Um, although texts from the time don't reference any specific features as far as I know, and unfortunately recordings of Scouse don't go that far back. As the more recent researcher points out, this mid-19th century period is exactly when we see a population boom in Liverpool because of people coming from other places, especially Ireland, uh, but also, I think, parts of Scotland. And many of these features we've gone through really strongly support that idea. So a lot of variants of Irish English famously pronounce the and the as t and the. Which are worth thousands of euro, thousands of euro, thousands of euro. An affrication of consonants like t is also really common throughout a lot of Ireland. There's a lot less of that. There's a lot less of that. There's a lot less of that. I'm not too concerned about the vowel differences because vowels are a lot more plastic and they tend to change a bit more readily than consonants do. But I think uh, across a lot of Ireland, uh, speakers also have the, the, the weak vowel merger that causes chicken and sicken to rhyme. Chicken, sicken. So that may also be a result of Irish influence, although it might just be an internal development. The slightly surprising thing which is highlighted by this 2007 study is the fact that Scouse is non-rhotic, like I said before, so an R sound isn't pronounced normally unless a vowel comes after it. Traditional Lancashire English and Irish English and Scottish English all tend to be rhotic, and in the 19th century a lot of Northern English dialects seem to have been rhotic even outside of Lancashire, so it seems surprising that non-roticity has won out in this situation. Um, and you, you, could, you could explain this in a number of ways, um, but it's hard to gather evidence for any of them in particular. What I will say is that I know there is some evidence for non-roticity in Lancashire in the early 1800s, even in places where roticity now exists. 
So in Preston, which is 30 miles north of Liverpool, where I go to university, you can learn a lot about this rotisity thing through the kinds of spelling mistakes that people made in old letters. Some letters that I'll cite in the description show us that the people writing them couldn't tell the difference between words that normally have a r in certain positions and words that don't. So brother and four are spelt without an r, father and petitions are spelt with one. And the affected r's are in exactly the positions you'd expect r to be deleted in non-rhotic dialect. So this suggests that maybe the people writing these letters aren't pronouncing these r's um, and so they can't tell where they're supposed to go in spelling. And bear in mind that roticity does exist in Preston nowadays, even among some younger speakers, so it's a very volatile thing. So I wouldn't be too surprised if non-roticity was a thing in Liverpool even before the Scouse dialect developed, and that maybe it's just survived to the present day, um, although that's something that's very hard to prove without more spelling evidence. Um, I hope this video has been a bit of fun for those of you who are interested in that kind of dialect, and for those of you who aren't, sorry for the nicheness of it. Um, I'm going to be doing a couple of collaborations um, probably over the next few weeks, one with Caroline Sipranovska about uh, cognition and universal grammar and then another one with um, Jackson Crawford about colour terms in Old Norse which he's very kindly agreed to talk about. Um, I, I, I realise not everybody's into collaborations uh, but hopefully I, th I think they're very interesting so um, hopefully other people agree. Um, and after that I will do probably something on the great vowel shift in northern England so if anyone has any specific questions about that um, they can put those in the comments and I'll try and get round to answering some of them in that video. So thank you very much indeed for watching and I will talk to you soon.